How's it going, everybody? My name's Anthony from the Knights of Horror, and I just got out of seeing Studio 666 featuring the Foo Fighters themselves. For starters, I have to say I am a huge Foo Fighters fan. I got to see them in concert uh, at Cal Jam in, I believe, 2018 or 2019. Um, and that was a fun experience. That was the first time I ever seen the Foo Fighters and uh, I've been in love with their music for a while now. So um, I even like Dave Groback. Obviously everyone knows uh, Dave Groback and Nirvana. Um, and his, his time in Queens of the Stone Age was a really fun time as well. But the Foo Fighters are taking on a new journey now and that is their first feature film. Um, and that is Studio 666. A lot of fun. If you love horror and comedy, you're going to love this movie. And more importantly, if you love the Foo Fighters, you'll definitely love this film. Uh, this is going to be our spoiler review for the film. We're going to talk uh, cameos. We're going to talk the story. And we're going to talk overall what a roller coaster of a film this is. Um, and so if you guys have not seen it, press pause, click off this video, go get your tickets and go see Studio 666 in theaters now. This is not sponsored, by the way. I just want people to go see this movie because I thought it was fun. And... Just a good time. Go see uh, Studio 666 and then come back to this and we'll talk about the film. If you're still here, I'm assuming you've already seen the film or you probably don't have interest in seeing the film and you want to hear what I thought about it. So maybe it will inspire you to go see the film. Yesterday on the channel, we put up a short non-spoiler review of the film. So if you want to go check that out before seeing the film, um, I highly recommend doing so. Today is going to be a little bit of a longer video to explain more in depth of the film and our thoughts, the cameos, everything. So. Let's get started. The film follows the Foo Fighters and, of course, Dave Grohl uh, as they're preparing to record their 10th studio album. Now, in the very beginning of the film, we get introduced to the house they're going to be re recording in, but we find out that it has a dark past. That being said, there was a band that they made up for the film that had uh, originally was recording their album in there, and in the beginning, we find out that uh, they all died mysteriously by this um, unknown figure force. We don't know yet um, until like later on in the film we find out who it is. Uh, so the Foo Fighters are in, uh, of course, the recording studio or the label that they record a lot of their music through. And uh, Jeff Garland, a great actor, funny actor, uh, is the manager. And he pretty much tells them they need to record a 10 studio album. It's been too long. He then suggests that... Um, they go to this house. Now, Dave Grohl wanted to record somewhere different. That wasn't a studio for once, and he wanted to kind of transition into something new, something they've never recorded before. So Jeff Garland recommends this house uh, that has the dark history on it. We're also introduced to Leslie Grossman. If you guys are fans of American Horror Story, you know Leslie Grossman very well. If not, a very talented actress. A lot of what she portrays is in horror. Um, and she, of course, she's done other things as well, but horror, you've, you've seen her a lot in American Horror Story and, and whatnot. So, uh, she's, she's freaking uh, hilarious in this film. She plays the realtor that ends up renting them out the house for their studio session. The band starts getting settled in and, uh, of course, Dave Grohl has a ton of writer's block trying to come up with ideas for new songs for this 10th album. They want to make it big because it is their 10th studio album. So they're, he's coming up with all this, you know, writer's block and everything, but, um, eventually leads to some inspiration. Um, while Dave Grohl is kind of wandering the house, he comes across the basement. Now, Prior to this engagement, we do see that a lot of weird stuff is starting to happen. When they first move into the house, uh, Dave Grohl is starting to know the, notice the acoustics in the uh, house, but every time he tries to test them out, flashes of the dead victims come in his head. So what ends up happening is they, they get settled in, they end up setting up everything, and uh, this was a cool cameo, one of the first that I noticed, uh, Kerry King of Slayer the guitarist of Slayer um, is actually in the film. He played their, um, he was supposed to be their recording guy and whatnot and their, and their, you know, he helped them out and whatnot, which was really cool. Uh, ends up getting killed early on in the film, electrocuted to death by uh, an unknown force, uh, which is basically one of the demons. Um, so that was really cool to see Kerry King, uh, especially, you know, after seeing one of his last farewell shows at, at the forum with Slayer, that was really cool to see him in this film. Uh, we then go on to Dave Grohl trying to convince the band that they need to complete this album for Carrie King's character. Um, so we end up following Dave Grohl and the band. And like I said, Dave Grohl has a ton of writer's block. He can't come up with new material. He ends up actually playing a lot of the old material and the band even calls him out on it, which was one of my favorite scenes. And we see him struggle with a ton of writer's block. He then goes down to the basement uh, one night. He cannot sleep. He orders, uh, or no, he has nightmares. Uh, 
with the demons kind of taunting him and whatnot and ends up waking up in the middle of the night, uh, orders a fuck ton of chicken parmesan for some reason, like four boxes of it, and uh, is just up all night trying to figure out what his next album is going to sound like. He then, finally, I know this is the third time we're going to it, but now we can progress with it. He goes down to the basement of the house, which is actually outside and around the the kind of side of the house, ends up going down to the basement and finds an altar of some sorts. Um, it's a dead raccoon with blood just dripping down. It looks pretty fresh as well, too. Uh, he then hears voices call his name, and when he turns around, he finds the tape deck that was recording the previous band's um, music. Now, the thing about this band is they died in this house, so they never got to finish their studio album. Dave Grohl ends up turning on the music and finds the sound he is looking for for the 10th studio album, but then the song gets cut short because all the tape was not there. He ends up getting frustrated and whatnot, and a whole massive thing happens where Dave Grohl ends up getting possessed. Uh, I will notice this. They took a lot of inspiration, it seemed like, from Evil Dead. Um, they had one person obviously possessed and the friends going off one by one, and they also took a lot of inspiration from The Exorcist. There's a lot of notable scenes in there where you see infer uh, references and whatnot from The Exorcist, which was a lot of, uh, a lot of fun, really cool. Uh, Dave Grohl ends up, uh, start he starts becoming possessed, and we start seeing him slowly one by one kill off the band uh, <laughs> for one of the guitar players he ends up uh killing him first gets his head uh fried on the grill and stabs him to death uh we also find out that the food delivery food guy uh, who's played by Will Forte, who is a funny actor, um, and he's trying to sell Dave Grohl on his new band's demo, which is called, um, what was it called, like Bone Adjustment or something like that? I, for I forget the name of the band, but he's trying to sell this new demo on him because he found out that he's delivering to Dave Grohl, um, and he ends up killing him as well. The deaths, I will say, were really cool in this movie. They really went practical, and they looked freaking awesome. And I'm a sucker for practical effects in horror films, especially when you're when you're killing someone. I'd love to see it more practical rather than CGI. Um, so the deaths in this scene were really, really good. They were all practical, it looked like to me, and I had a lot of fun seeing how creative uh, Dave Grohl can kill each one of his bandmates. Uh, the second one to go down. Who was the second one to go down? I believe... It was, who was the second one to go down? I believe it was the hip, hippie stoner looking guy. Uh, I, I don't know all their names except for Dave Grohl and um, the drummer whose name is now slipping my thing. I guess I'm not a real Foo Fighters fan, right? Anyway, uh, they kill the drummer off and he gets killed in the most epic way where he gets a symbol going through his face into the back of his skull and cutting his face and the rest of his body in half, which was really fucking sick. Uh, the next person to die, oh no, that was, that was the drummer. The hippie guy is uh, in love with the, the neighbor um, and ends up uh, finally banging her after they had a whole session of her explaining what happened to the last band and what's going on and what needs to happen for Dave Grohl to go back to normal. That was a cool death as well because Dave Grohl has ended up hiding under the bed while they're having sex and he ends up starting up a chainsaw and splitting them both in half. That was bitching. That was probably the best death of the scene. Hands down. Two people, a two for one uh, kill in that, that scene and it was just, it was great. Um, we then go on to, of course, the, uh, the last two bandmates that he has left. Um, which is the bass player and the guitar, other guitarist, uh, and they find the book, which is very similar to the Necronomicon um, from Evil Dead, and they end up uh, trying to unpossess Dave Grohl, which ends up on a wild goose hunt. We do end up seeing Dave Grohl throwing the remains of um, the drummer's body inside of a wood chipper, which I thought was pretty funny, um, but the two remaining bandmates end up finding out how to stop Dave Grohl and they end up having a final confrontation in the pool area. The guitar player ends up um, blessing the pool with holy water, making it holy water. And Dave Grohl has a really epic scene where he's talking in his demon voice and the demons are standing right behind him and whatnot. So that was really cool to see that. But it ultimately came down to Dave Grohl jumping over the pool only for the guitar player to hold the Necronomicon up, zap a bolt of lightning, 
onto Dave Grohl, which ultimately causes Dave Grohl to fall into the pool and get unpossessed. They pull Dave Grohl out of the pool, end up um, seeing, of course, uh, him unpossessed. He ends up throwing up, and the real demon, who was the original singer from the band that was fatally murdered in that uh, house, comes out of the throw up. He ends up coming and manifesting into a human form. And you find out he obviously was the one that killed the entire band, and he was the original person that spawned the demon in the first place. They have a cool confrontation until the original band comes back and helps Dave Grohl finish off this demon. At this point, we uh, see that their curse was broken, they are free, and they end up killing the demon, putting them back into the book. Dave Grohl and the rest of the band end up wanting to leave now, uh, until Dave Grohl is stopped by none other than Garland. Garland comes up with uh, Leslie and they end up finding out that they're part of this like satanic thing and he says rock and roll is uh, ruled by Satan and whatnot. Uh, and we find out that uh, <laughs> it doesn't end well for the other two bandmates. While they leave Dave Grohl in the courtyard, they end up going to get their van, which is the iconic van that they've toured in for many years and they even made a documentary about it. So that was a cool little cameo of the van. Um, but they end up getting the van and they end up having to hotwire it. The guitar player ends up going down trying to hotwire it from the bottom while the other guy, the bass player, is in the car and he's trying to start it up. Uh, he ends up starting it up while Leslie Grossman is walking towards them wearing this kind of hood. She's ready to stab him. She's got a knife going. And he ends up starting up the car right when she's about to approach and ends up killing the guitar player, runs him over, another great kill. Uh, face gets smashed and everything, and then um, runs over Leslie Grossman, and she dies. Uh, right before she dies, though, she turns around and stabs the bass player in the mouth, and all the Foo Fighters are dead except for one. Garland and Dave Grohl end up having a little conversation in the thing, telling Dave Grohl that you finished the song. I've been waiting for the song to be finished for 20 years and whatnot. And he goes, what do you think about a solo career? And we ultimately skip to a year later. Dave Grohl has now gone solo. The Foo Fighters are dead. And he find, we do find out he got possessed again by the demon. And the movie ends with his eyes, little black like lines going up to his eyes, symbolizing that he's possessed. And now he is a solo act. And that wrapped the movie up right there. So... My thoughts about this movie is, honestly, going into it, I was a little skeptical. I was like, uh, this movie looks like it's going to be more fun than, like, it, does, it looks like it's going to be really bad. And I, I walked out like, that was actually pretty good, and it was funny, and they had a lot of good horror aspects, a lot of great references, a lot of great cameos. A couple cameos that we got, obviously, Carrie King from Slayer was a huge one that was really cool. Um, what was really cool that you found out in the beginning of this film uh, when they rolled the credits was John Carpenter and Cody Carpenter actually scored this movie. Uh, so they must be good friends with Dave Grohl, which I thought was really cool. Um, they actually make an, uh, or at least John Carpenter makes an appearance, a cameo appearance as their um, in-studio mixer, uh, which I thought was really cool. So they're pretty much, he made a cameo of playing really what he does as a career, um, or at least one of his careers. He's a filmmaker, he's a writer, he's a freaking um, score maker he does it all uh, so it was cool to see John Carpenter in this cameo that was really cool Will Forte really funny um, Leslie Grossman always amazing very talented um, Garland's great he's he's always funny and he you know him from so many great projects most notably the Goldbergs he's the star on that so he was really funny um, and it was just cool to see Lionel Richie had a freaking cameo in the in the movie that was really cool um, so you know this movie was a lot of fun if you're going in you like the Foo Fighters, you want to have fun, and you want to get a little scared, this is the movie for you. If you're thinking this is going to be an Academy Award-worthy horror film or like a freaking movie horror film on the level of like Hereditary or Midsummer, maybe not the movie for you. But nonetheless, I highly suggest you go see Studio 666 out now in theaters. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you guys did... If you guys did enjoy this video, make sure to hit that like button and comment down below what you thought of Studio 666 and should I make more horror movie reviews? Because I do like doing it. When I got out of the movie theater, I immediately thought to myself, I have to make a review on this. Whether two people watch it or 2,000 people watch it, I don't care. I had to make get my voice out there. Uh, with all that being said, my name is Anthony from the Knights of Horror and I will see you guys next week for another video.